Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is a whopper. No spoilers, we'll drive straight in. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! I'm very tentatively bringing my drink to my face. Whoa. Because um, I feel I had to fill it up. So, it, you know, I had to. I don't normally have, I'm going to have a look seeing, what is it? Floral, floral tonic water. I don't think I've had floral tonic water before, but it is, it's it's nice. Mm, pleasant. don't think we've done a big bad boy like this for a while. So I, yeah, all the talk of the snakes last week, by the way, we had to have a snake man come round into the garden. That makes it sound like we had a man that's a snake, but he's like a special man that to, he helps you get rid of snakes, right? He came round, couldn't find the snake, he'd gone. Good. So it inspired me to pick a case, and we are going to Australia. We're going down under Perth, Australia. Australia, mate. Barbies, snakes, sharks, Bondi Rescue. I love Bondi Rescue. Mm -mm. Also, the case takes place in 1986, the year that moi was born. So I was drawn to it. Yeah, I'm enjoying the floral. On the 6th of October in 1986, a student called Mary Nielsen would be on the hunt for some cheap tyres for her car. She arrives at the home of David and Catherine Burney. I think Catherine and David rolls off the tongue easier. We'll see what comes naturally. No sooner had Mary stepped through the front door and she was gagged and then she was chained to a bed. So ambush, basically. What happens next is just stuff of nightmares. Honestly, I'm so surprised at how many times I'm surprised by these cases, but stuff of nightmares. David raped Mary several times, all the while with Catherine watching on. And this ordeal went on for a couple of days. Eventually, they drove Mary to a national park where, on arriving, David then raped Mary once again. And then he proceeded to strangle Mary and he then stabbed her also through the heart. And then the couple buried Mary's body. And then Two weeks later, two weeks after Mary's disappearance, a girl called Susanna Candy, she was 15 at the time, she also went missing. Susanna had unfortunately hitchhiked a lift with just the wrong people. She had got into the car with Catherine and David Burney. I think hitchhiking was a much more I think nowadays, does it even really happen? You don't see it now, do you? You really, do. like, I, I cannot honestly tell you the last time I saw someone hitchhiking. It's just like a rarity because of things like this. Jeez. You've got to live and learn, haven't you? Different times, like I say, 15 and hitchhiking. It must have been terrifying because on the drive back to their house, they held a knife to Susanna. So, you know, she knew quickly that she was in trouble and they drove her back to their house where the same MO played out. She was gagged, she was chained to the bed and then she was raped. In the morning, they made Susanna ring her parents. They held a knife to her throat and they threatened that they would end her life if she didn't. And they made her say that she was going to be staying with a friend for a couple of days. They were buying themselves time, buying themselves these days where she wouldn't be reported missing and they could do what they wanted. At the end of Susanna's like, horrific ordeal, the couple then attempted to strangle Susanna much as they had done with Mary she put up a very very big fight for her life so much so that they had to force sleeping pills down her throat so that they could subdue her and then they strangled her when she was unconscious the pair then drove her body to the national park to bury her body now David and Catherine, or Catherine and David, they are equal, equal, you know, vileness. Couldn't think of a word in this situation. 
Catherine is not one of those women that's, you know, under David's. Well, in some respect, but we'll get to that. But she was certainly not an unwilling participant in these situations. David was not in charge. If anything, Catherine is the more dominant force of the pair. It would turn out that Catherine would actually be the one that would decide who they kill and who they don't. They would often pick up hitchhikers. This was not a rarity. But often, if the woman was not to Catherine's liking, that hitchhiker would just get her lift home and be none the wiser. Oh, how scary. How close. Crikey. Imagine knowing that you'd got in the car with them. Like, whoa. Also, how do they pick? How do they decide? I wonder that. Not that you'd be like, oh, what's wrong with me? <laughs> God. But do you know what I mean? Like, I wonder what, I wonder what, because I can't think of anything with the victims that was particularly similar, really. Hmm. I'm assuming it must have been some sort of vulnerability that Catherine saw. When somebody takes Catherine's fancy, there was a code. She would say to David, I've got the munchies. Ugh. That is just... It just makes me cringe that. That makes me cringe so hard. I've got the munchies. Oh, please. To an extent, I think David had to agree because I read somewhere that he would say, I've got the munchies too. <laughs> it's just so, that's so, it's so horrible. Eerie. It's eerie that, isn't it? So these two are a right pair, obviously. They met as children, but it wasn't as straightforward as their relationship, just like they met and that was it. No, things got in the way a bit. They both had very troubled childhoods. And a bit like the case, oh, the Twilight Killers, the two teenagers that came together in their troubled way because of their equally disturbing childhoods really they had something in common didn't they it connected them it brought them together <sighs> this is what happened here David was the eldest of quite a lot of siblings his mother was an alcoholic and his father worked all the hours that God could send because they were so poor which meant obviously the children were left in the care of their very alcoholic mother and they lived in squalor is the only way I can describe it they were always filthy they didn't eat properly squalor a lot of pressure was placed on David. He was the eldest and his mother relied on him heavily at a very young age. So we're not talking about a teenager here. When David was like a, a child, he had to take care of younger siblings. And if he didn't do that correctly or to her liking, he would get beaten, severely beaten. These beatings would be frequent, sometimes with a brim handle. Eventually, all of the children were taken into care. So that just adds another layer of stress, abandonment issues, lots of things going on here for him in his childhood. So much so that when he was eight, just eight, that is when he began his criminal life, basically. Catherine Harrison, Harrison before Bernie, she also was dealt a rather crappy card as a kid. Catherine's mother died when she was only two years old in childbirth with her younger brother. And then a couple of days or weeks later, the brother also died, the baby. This left her father bereft and he couldn't cope. There was, I, 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 did, I couldn't find enough of what I wanted there. But anyway, I was going, to, I was like, oh, okay, this, don't get lost in it. But she ended up, I believe, abroad with grandparents and then there was a, a big custody battle to get her back I think with her father sorry if that is not correct but I think that's what happened there so she was sort of pillar to post and when she was with her grandparents she wasn't well looked after there either so it wasn't like she was ripped away from some loving grandparents she didn't have a nice childhood I think it was South Africa that she she went to with grandparents and she ended up back in Perth, Australia, when she was 10, back to living near David and his family. She was often picked on. She was often left out. She was bullied. Again, more layers. By the ages of 12 and 14, so Catherine was 12, David was 14, they had met again. So they were quickly in a relationship. 
a very codependent one because they had found each other. They completed each other. They were the loves of each other's lives. They understood each other. They both came from pain. They both came from pain. Isn't that interesting? I find it so interesting. I really do. It's so common for like these troubled souls to find each other and, and just hold on tight. And like I said last time in the Twilight case, that can be beautiful. And these people can end up having loving, wonderful relationships and growing together and, you know, leaving all of that horrible childhood trauma behind them and helping each other to heal. And sometimes not so much. They become so connected through their pain and unconventional upbringings, don't they? Just, yeah. You can see why. You want to be understood. Why is it just got, like, boiling hot in here? Why? Excuse me while I drink my flowers. Kids bought me that glass. Nice, isn't it? The couple would begin their life of crime immediately. Obviously, David was already in trouble with the law. And Catherine just went along for the ride. They were often caught because they were actually rubbish, rubbish criminals. And this would see David often in and out of like det detention centres and youth. What do you call that? Like young offenders, but what is it? Juvenile. GV? Is that what it is? GV? Oh, I don't know in Australia. Don't know. I reckon it's GV, the same as America. Someone from Australia, let me know. What do you call that? Youth offenders, institutes. I don't, I don't even think that's real, to be honest, even here. Made it up. Childhood detention centre? Children, child's detention? No, that's at school, isn't it? Maybe, could be right, don't know. Last time I guessed, I was right, wasn't I? I think mostly they were breaking and entering, stealing, theft, things like that. Naughty. And Catherine's father was desperate for her to cut ties with David because, well, he was a terrible influence, wasn't he? But the bond was just, it was just too strong. Catherine was well in there. She was head over heels. Sadly, her father's predictions came to fruition because she eventually was arrested. She was caught and she was sentenced to six months in prison. However, this ended up being like a lifeline for Catherine. It was a positive thing. She was separated from David and in her detention centre or prison, whatever, we're going to call it prison. When she was in there, she had a lot of counselling and, you know, rehabilitation. They were trying to rehabilitate her and it worked. She came to realise how unhealthy her relationship with David was, the codependency, all of that. And she worked through a lot of those issues while she was in, in prison. When she comes out of prison, she ends up getting a job as a house keeper for I think a quite affluent family and she ends up falling in love with their son and the pair marry when she is 21 years old. Similarly David is also given a lifeline out of this you know troubled life basically. He's really small, he's like a small person, small stature and he gets a job at a stables the boss looks at his sort of like, you know, size and what have you. And obviously there must have been other attributes, I'm sure. And he really thought he could make a jockey out of David. Quickly, he discovers that David is living in shocking conditions and he tries to help the kid out. So he tries to take him out of his horrible home life. He finds him somewhere to live with a landlady and he you know he says he's gonna train him up as a jockey this is like a very very good opportunity for David he could completely turn his life around here I think that's like quite a fruitful career isn't it jockey gotta be in it if you win I suppose I don't know be researching jockeys later don't get too excited though because the psychopathic tendencies have well and truly been unlocked with this one he has lived with his landlord, landlady. She's elderly. He's lived with her for about three weeks before he attempts to rape her. So that is then over. She was in bed and he just clambered in. What? This was not the, the first time that David has just clambered into bed with somebody to have his way. No. David has some issues. Well, obviously, but he has some sexual issues. I don't even know what to, what to, what it is. 
an incredibly high sex drive, it, like insatiable. Is that the word? Oh, wow. The words are all going. This is what happens when I have myself a, a floral gin, you see. His desire was so high that if he didn't get what he needed, like, which was every single day, and even that was like, you know, barely enough. Can you imagine? What the heck? Anyhow, so that was the situation. If that wasn't occurring for him on the daily or multiple times a day, he was vile. I mean, he sounds pretty vile anyway. So, so much so that once he asked his own brother, he was like, can we, you know, and his brother was like, oh, no. And then his brother, he woke up in the night with him. Yeah, we'll leave that there. This part of David's life didn't go well. And he also lost his job as a at the stables and a potential jockey position because he was also abusing the horses. So that just failed miserably. However, David went on to marry a woman called Kerry, again, when he was 21. And they went on to have a daughter together. She would also say that his he was just... There was no pleasing him, basically. He was in, he was insatiable. I think that's the word. So, David and Catherine have moved on with their lives. They are apart from each other. It's not too bad. Everything's kind of like, all right. Catherine's landed a pretty sweet deal. She's with this man. She goes on to have six children. Seven. Seven children. Sadly, tragedy would strike for Catherine. And one of her children, I believe one of the youngest children is run over in front of her eyes and she witnesses it and the child dies and that is just horrific and this is a huge trigger for Catherine it's a massive trauma isn't it also David living along in his life suffers a horrific head injury a shipping container where he works is like basically dropped on his head it sounds like oh my gosh huge horrible injury cracked skull you know severe severe injury this accident also triggers something in David so David and Catherine it's like I found it interesting how they part from each other as children and come back together then they part from each other again guess what's going to happen but also things in their lives when they're not even together are so mirror so similar so similar they both suffer this traumatic event they both get married at 21 just it's like you couldn't write it you know that sort of thing david's injury just triggers behavioral changes big ones he starts having affairs with multiple women all the time you know, a lot. And also with his situation, I'm not surprised that that manifests itself, but he does that frequently. He even put an ad in the local newspaper, like requesting partners, right? And it doesn't seem like he was being particular. He wasn't trying to hide any of this. He was quite just blasé about it. Just, yeah. And then one day he comes home, right? With a 16 year old girlfriend introduces her to his wife as his girlfriend, like comes in, comes home, put a kettle on love, uh, this is my girlfriend. What? Goes upstairs, empties out his own daughter's bedroom, says, oh, she can sleep in with us because this room's going to be for my girlfriend. As you can imagine, wife, wifey, she thinks, oh, he, okay, it's finally happened, he's lost the plot and I'm, I'm going. So she leaves. So he's slowly just breaking down. And it is at this time, after they have both suffered these incredible traumatic events in their lives, that Catherine and David bump into each other again. Yeah. Timing. And it was a calamity. Catherine, not long after meeting David, she goes out for a walk and she never goes home. She walks out on her six children and her husband. Just She just leaves. And she goes to be with David. So she's come back. She's drawn back in. They're just so, like, it feels very wrong and weird to say that they're meant for each other. But it's like the universe is like, the magnetism is just pulling them back, isn't it? This is when the couple move into Morehouse Street. And David gets a job at a car mechanics. 
This is when David's sexual fantasies really come to the forefront in their relationship, like, well, they're there. He shares his sadomasochistic sexual desires with Catherine. She does not, you know, she's not fazed by that. That's okay. She's down with it. She does not shy away. Grand, each to their own. Consenting adults, you know, whatever floats your boat. But David grows very tired quite quickly of just the talk, of just talking about his fantasies with Catherine. He wants more. He wants them to become real and they get darker. And at this point, when Catherine really should be like, oh, step too far, love, not for me. No, that that's too much. She's like, yeah, let's go. And they start planning. They even read a book about how to get away with the perfect murder. And then they begin their murderous rampage, which begins with Mary Nilsson. After they have abducted and murdered Susanna Candy and buried her in the same national park as Mary, just 10 days later, they strike again. So it's it's moving quickly, isn't it? But this is where it gets like, yeah, like, like Psycho or something, like proper out of a film. The pair meet 31-year-old Nolene Patterson. She's broken down at the side of the road and they offer her a lift home. Wrong place, wrong time. Oh, it's just so frustrating, isn't it? It's just wrong place, wrong time. Nicole was an air stewardess and she was beautiful. She was glamorous. She was also older than the previous victims. Mary Nilsson was 22 and Susanna Candy was 15 years old. Nolene is 31. And David finds her intoxicating. This is very different. This is not like the other two times. He basically fancied the pants off of her. And this pisses Catherine off. She is, she is angry. Very, very, mm. and that anger just, it grows. Catherine's massively jealous here. Your absolute love of your life is is looking at this other person that way. She knows. She's not stupid. She can see the, you know, the goings on, the chemistry, whatever. And there was chemistry, weirdly, because if you can call it that. But Nolene was not stupid. Nolene knew she was older. She knew that she had to try and manipulate the situation so that she could possibly save her life. So she kind of played along with what was happening here. She fed into David's fantasy. At one point, they were cuddling and canoodling, and Nolene was leaning into it because she thought it might save her life if she could, like, you know, get him on side, think that this was a relationship. And she is kept captive for two days. It kind of works. She's there longer than the other people. I think he doesn't want to let her go. He's enjoying this, but Catherine's rage, I'm going to call it rage, and her jealousy just grows too much. They end up having a massive row. She storms out. When she returns, she has an ultimatum. It's her or me. She takes a knife and she threatens to kill herself if he does not choose her. David chose Catherine. While Nolene was enticing and intoxicating for him, Catherine was his partner in crime and he knew that. The couple forced sleeping pills down Nolene's throat and Catherine would be the one to strangle Nolene and she enjoyed it very much. When it came to burying Nolene's body, David really rubbed salt in the wound here. <sighs> Catherine must have been like, mate, if I was him I would have been sleeping one eye open because he, he would have peed her off. He refused to bury Nolene with the other two victims because she was too good. Can you imagine? I can almost feel Catherine's like the rage bubbling, you know, inside at that moment. He should have been so careful. She probably had a shovel, bop him on the head. He also said that she must be buried with her underwear on, but it ha she had to be more dignified. May watch out. David gets his wish. She is buried separately and she also is buried with her underwear on. And now... Only four days later, they are out again. Four days later, so it's getting quicker. The couple pick up Denise Brown. Again, she's hitchhiking. She's a computer analyst. Again, same MO. They pick her up. 
knife, take her back to the house, gag her and chain her to the bed. David ropes Denise. The next morning, she is forced to make a phone call to say that she won't be home for a few days. She's drugged. She's taken to the forest, she is raped again, and then David cuts her throat. Now, I find that interesting because I think he is still peed off about Nolene. I think that's anger coming out there because the strangulation has always been their method of killing. And that is more severe, isn't it, I think, than than the knife. So I almost feel like that's a bit of a like, like, he's cross speculation but that's what I think. While he is burying Denise he believes that she has passed away. She actually sits up. She is not dead and she screams. He casually walks back to his car, gets an axe out of the boot and then he strikes her over the head twice and then continues very cold, very disconnected and just vile. The police at this point do begin to start connecting these disappearances. All four victims, all four missing people, because at this point they're missing, the police don't know that they have died. All of them have made phone calls to loved ones to say that they're going to be away for a couple of days. Very similar phone calls, but all have never come home. So even though they're different ages, things like that, different, you know, like I say, I couldn't really think of things that like that they're similar in any way. But yeah, but that phone call links all four. The heat has just hit me. Might be the gin. <laughs> oh, oh, I flicked water in my ear hole. Mm, condensation. While the police try and find these victims, David and Catherine, they're at it again. They're out again. Five days later, they find their next victim. And this is where it gets truly spicy. And I cannot begin to, to tell you. I hope I do this justice. Their next victim is 17-year-old Kate Moi, and this is where we get a real insight into their MO and what this must have been like for their other victims, because Kate, Kate freaking survived. She survived. And it's like tense. Mm, it's, It's so tense. When they arrived home, gagged, chained, they made her watch Rambo, right? What? Also, something to mention is that they were taking drugs, heroin, other things. So, you know, not so weird when you think that they're just off their pickle. But they they Rambo. They also made her dance for them, which was not very nice. And she was very sad about it. And then they made her have a shower. And then after this, this is when David begins to rape her. It's about midnight. And she confirmed that Catherine watches as well. After this, she's made to shower again. She said that she was made to shower before and after every time. Eventually, she's moved into David and Catherine's bedroom. And here, she is raped again. And then David offers her sleeping pills. He says, you know, like, it will help you sleep. Trust me, you need some sleep. She takes the sleeping pills and she puts them under her tongue and then she shoves them under the mattress. She doesn't have any of that. She doesn't take that, no. And she is handcuffed to David so she can't go anywhere. He then just goes to sleep and she's just handcuffed next to him for the rest of the night. In the morning, she is made to call her parents at knife point and tell them that she drank too much the night before and that she's sorry she's not home and she'll be, she won't be home for, for a while. Kate notices that when David's gone to work, Catherine is lonely. Now, Kate is a bit of a clever cookie, actually. She decides to utilise this, play on this again. She's trying to sort of think about what can save her life like Nolene did. So Kate befriends Catherine quite quickly. She even convinces Catherine to feed her. And at one point, she convinces her to take her chains off. So she's unchained, she's fed, and then they watch TV together. Don't you find it eerie that David's just out of work? Just, this is going on, this horror film, he's just plodded off to work. And people said he was, like, quite normal, like he was quite a normal chap. He wasn't, you know, like, sometimes people are like, oh, yeah, could have guessed it. No, their neighbours, none the wiser. They just thought they were a bit quiet. They had no idea. Also, neighbours never saw any of these women. Five. There were five. Never. Never any witness to see these women go into their house 
or hit, they'd never heard anything. Mad. They must have got that right straight away and got that down to a T. Get them in unseen, gag them straight away. Nothing is heard. And then, yeah, honestly, I five women, not a single neighbour saw or heard anything. Found that fascinating. And what was I going to say? It's gone. Yeah, David just at work, casual. Just think he sat down, had lunch. Also, this made me just like, yes. Kate, clever cookie, she decided to hide things around their house because she thought, and I'm just like, yeah, right? Yes. She thought that when they find my body, because she really believed that she was going to die, she, she thought they were going to kill her. Can you imagine? <sighs> Poor kid. She so strongly thought that, that she... She was like, when they find me, I want them to know that you did this to me. So she hid things that belonged to her down the side of the sofa, stuff like that. She was just hiding little clues. What's that like? Hansel and Gretel. She was doing that around the house because she was just like, that I want them to, I want you to be brought to justice when you, after you've killed me. Come on. Who's who's thinking that as well? Like, she's she's thinking that because she fully believes that they're going to kill her. That is, it's terrifying. But also what a clear thought process to have in that terrifying moment. She she mainly really did think that because at one point, I think a news article or she re- or Catherine was reading a newspaper about missing Denise Brown and she scoffed and she laughed at it. And basically it was very clear that they had had something to do with her disappearance and that she was dead. At some point, there is a knock at the door and it is Catherine and David's drug dealer bringing them the goodies. And so this is a a knock on the door that Catherine's very keen to answer. So she doesn't have time to shackle Kate again. So she just shoves her in a bedroom. She hides her. She's like, just wait in there. So she puts her in a bedroom and Kate waits until she hears the door. She hears Catherine open the door and speak to the person, and she goes straight to the window at that point. She breaks the lock. She opens the window. She jumps out, and she runs, and she runs for her life. She tries three neighbours, and no one's in. Can you imagine how terrifying that is? And then she runs to a local shop, the nearest shop, and she says to the person outside, I have been raped. Please let me in. The police are called, and... After hearing what she has to say, I don't think she was believed at first. I think there was a bit of like, is she on something? I mean, obviously, like, hysterical as well. She would have been a state, and I think that that sometimes doesn't come across like very believable, perhaps. They weren't sure. But then they said, you know, can you take us there? And she did. She did. And the police officer said that when she got near to the address, her reaction was so severe it was so traumatic that they all just instantly knew that she was telling the truth she'd also told them that she'd hidden things and where she'd hidden them and when they went in to the house which the front door was open when the police went in they found all of the things that she had said it just proved her story they also found chains drugs you name it Catherine knew what had happened she was like oh she's escaped well obviously she would have known and that she's scarpered, she's off, she's, you know, she doesn't want to get caught, she probably feels like she's gonna, they're gonna catch them, but they come home, so the police wait there, obviously, they wait at the house, and David and Catherine come back, genius, I mean, thank God, apparently Catherine put up a right fight, like a bobcat, I've never seen what a bobcat does, but I'm assuming it's like, (laughs) the couple did not cooperate in questioning, but as it got later, David just, I think he just broke. I think he also just was one of those, you know, where they want to share what they've done. The police officer said something like, if I get you a shovel, would you just come and just show us where they are? And he was like, yeah. And then he said that there was four of them, that police officer. That must be such a weird moment because it's like, yes, but also, no. That means that four women are dead but you've caught the guy. So really weird feeling there. Catherine maintained her innocence until they told her that David had spilt the beans. And then she was a a bit the same, just like, oh, all right, okay then, oh yeah, I'll tell you everything. I'll show you where they are. Yeah, no worries. Right, you know, they just, 
they were proud, I think. They were proud of what they had done. She definitely was because she showed the police the bodies with pride, especially Nolene. When they arrived at Nolene's grave, she proceeded to spit on it. There are no words. They pleaded guilty. Thank you, please. Not often they do that, is it? And they were sentenced to life without parole. A thank you, please. That's quite tidy, like that. Guilty, yes. Life without parole, yes. Sometimes it blows your mind, doesn't it? And you're like, really? What? But no, that's quite, I like that. In 2005, David took his own life in prison. Catherine is still in prison. And she runs the prison library. And can you believe it? Guess who her pen pals are? Can you freaking guess? Honestly, I'm going to pause for a minute and I'm going to give you three guesses. Pen pals, who do you reckon? Go. Myra Hindley and Eileen Wernos, pen pals. That shouldn't be allowed to happen. In 2010, she applied for parole. Uh, jog on. And it was denied. Thank you. I do believe that David's daughter has changed her surname and she is trying to move on and move past it with having nothing to do with it and just is disgusted by the whole thing and who her father is. And I couldn't find anything about uh, Catherine's children. She did leave them when they were incredibly young and I hope they don't have much memory of that or her, to be honest. And that is all I have for you on today's terrifying case. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Cinetonic. Hope you can join me next week for another true crime story and a beautiful glass of floral Jean. I am a silly sausage because I forgot to mention at the end of last week's video that my Patreon is all set up and ready. Ta-da! That's one thing we have got done. So yeah, the link will be, I'm going to pin it in a comment. I'm going to put it in my description. And I think if you go to the about information in the channel, click on about, a boot, then it's in there as well with my Instagram and stuff. Yeah, it's very exciting. Thank you so much to the people that have joined already. <laughs> Literally, I was just so excited. It was like kid at Christmas. I'm just starting to think about what I'm going to put in my first Patreon video as well, because I'm going to do a bit of extra content, exclusive content for uh, mem the Patreon members. So that'd be exciting. Shop isn't ready yet, but kids are still off school, man. Kids are still off school, driving us nuts. There's just never a spare second. So yeah, let's get them back. And then I can pester Paul about the shop. He will love me for it. We, we love him, we love you. Love you. I'm liking the floral gin. It's gone right to my head, that is. And my cheeks. <laughs> I must say it's been much nicer to be up here today because I know the snake has gone. And there's not much else to report, I'm afraid, because we, like I said, we're still in the summer holidays. So, yeah, they go back on Monday. I love them dearly. I really do. But when you get to the end, that's what gin's for. Oh. I could talk all evening this evening because I just feel like I'd love to. But I am really hot. I don't know. Maybe it's because I haven't had a gin in a while. And it's like making me rosy but I am really really hot I'm gonna finish this now should I do it should I do it down in one? Oh my god down in one down in one can I they're deceptive these glasses look at that it's a very odd vessel all of this went in right how many is this two two hundred mil and a double of gin <sighs> and I did have ice didn't I I wonder if this is like what I think it is from this angle that's a gulp but from there, that's like two gulps. Should we just see? Ready? Join me for Patreon. I'll just get pissed. <laughs> can you imagine? No, right, okay, I'm going to go. I reckon I can do it down in one. I don't know. I'm not working tomorrow, no. Down in one. Not even a gulp. Less than a gulp. Deceptive. Or big fat mouth. <laughs> Okay, right, I must go. I'm just going to embarrass myself otherwise. Okay, I love you. I will see you in the comments. I love and look forward to that very much every single week. And I will see you next week for another episode of Syntonic. Love you all. Bye.